Good evening, everyone. Welcome. File in. Take your seats. You're watching Dangerous Thoughts here on Unsafe Space. I'm your host, Carter Laren. This is a series we do every Wednesday. Well, mostly every Wednesday, in which we defend individual sovereignty, individualist ethics, using reason. Uh, we're not interested in in the uh, not interested in the modern pseudo philosophy kind of crap floating around that involves arbitrary metaphysical assertions and a fair amount of ayahuasca. We don't do that. Uh, for us, philosophy is about living here on Earth, uh, defending the best ideas of the Enlightenment, helping to usher in Enlightenment, the sequel, part de, uh, and fight against collectivist ideology and the psychological dysfunction that is necrotizing this beloved nation we call America. Hey, Tomahawk Outlaw, welcome to chat. Um, I'm reminded, someday I'll tell you a story about a guy on ayahuasca. I think the NDA has expired, but I should check. I won't use his name, but I don't, I don't know that it's expired yet. It's a good ayahuasca. It's a weird ayahuasca story. Anyway, um, will today's show be short, as I often say? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, two topics today. Seemingly unrelated, but everything's really related in philosophy. Uh, we're going to talk about good guys with guns, the Greenwood Park Mall shooting, uh, which happened on Sunday. And I don't know if you heard the news, but Socrates is dead. We're going to talk about the death of Socrates. I know it's a shocker. Um, we're going to talk about his death a little bit. And, uh, you know, Alex uh, Maselli, who hosts 451 Degrees, also does some social media stuff for us. And I told her what the topics for dangerous thoughts were going to be tonight. And she said, uh, yeah, lead with the first one. She thinks the death of Socrates is not all that exciting. I tend to disagree. I think it's actually the more interesting of the two topics, but I will obey and we will lead with the first one. Uh, in addition to this series, dangerous thoughts, we have rebel civics, uh, I think Keith did a show earlier today. That's also on Wednesdays. Keith, Keith did a show earlier today called Living Remotely. Um, yesterday we had a show. Uh, we do a series called 451, as I mentioned, that Alex hosts. She uh, spoke yesterday about collusion between big tech and government and the UN putting pressure on big tech or, or in empowering big tech to do censorship on their behalf. Every Monday we do narrative dissonance which is uh, a panel of, of journalists talk about the news. And on Thursday evenings, i.e. tomorrow evening, we have Token Minority Report with our very own Beverly and Alex, which I think this week is a birthday bash. I think it's Beverly's birthday. They're having a birthday bash. If you're the kind of person that likes live stream birthday bashes, do that. Uh, if you're the kind of person that likes to read Plato, stay here. We're going to talk about the death of Socrates. I mean, the death of Socrates, I, I can't, there's nothing more breaking and exciting than that. Okay. Um, oh, we have a book club. The next book for book club is this book, Fossil Future by Alex Epstein. Epstein. Uh, August 14th, I think. I haven't started it yet, but I'm sure it's good. His other stuff is good. He's a good writer. So begin if you want, if you want to be involved in that. So Raphael says Simon, Simon Mall's security failed to stop the gunman who did not follow Mall's policy. They were nowhere in sight. Yeah, but in fairness, I mean, I'm not here to defend Mall cops, so sure. But uh, as you'll find out when we go through the timeline, he had 15 seconds before the guy took him out. So, I mean, if the Mall guys were over at the food court, oh, I guess the shooting was at the food court. So maybe they were at Claire's getting some cheap jewelry. I don't know. But if that's where the cops were, it would take them a few seconds to get over there. Anyway. Um, oh, also, before we officially start, think of someone you haven't shared this content with anything on Unsafe Space. Go share it with them. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube or Rumble or Odyssey or Utreon or somewhere. Uh, go to unsafespace.com if you want to support the show. You can watch everything there, blah, blah, blah. I'm tired of advertising. So let's get on with it. Whoa, one more thing. The two topics we're going to talk about is Greenwood Park mall shooting and, as I mentioned, the breaking news of Socrates' death. But uh, right before we went live, our intrepid uh, producer and token minority, Beverly, sent me this uh, this thing on Discord. Let me share it with you guys because uh, I, I've watched it, but 
and I don't think we need to watch this, but it's just interesting. We can we can comment on it, I guess. Uh, let's see. The this is from National File, and the headline here for those of you listening only is warrantless ATF agent. Let's repeat that first word: warrantless. ATF agents show up at Delaware man's home, demand to see his guns. I guess they already shot the dog, so they didn't need to see those, but just his guns. Um, the agents, along with a state trooper, shame on you, state trooper, for accompanying the ATF unwarranted to a guy's house uh, to intimidate uh, the citizen. Shame on you. Uh, and obviously shame on the ATF, but that's basically working at the ATF. You should know you're a piece of shit already. So, uh, the agents, along with a state trooper, showed up at the man's family home after he purchased a new firearm. I watched the video. I would I would subject you to the video, but it is like it's two videos, each about a minute, and they are boring. They're super boring. Oh, these ads. Look at that disgusting ad. Okay. Um, well, we'll just read. Warrantless ATF agents showed up on the front porch of a Dolan Man man's home. Demanding to see his firearms. Now, the way they do it, maybe we should watch a little bit of it, but I'm not sure. The way they do it, yeah, they were demanding. But they're, you know, they're good at a couple things. One is shooting dogs. Um, and two is uh, social engineering. The guy's kind of smiley, and he's like, oh, look, you know, you're not in trouble. You didn't do anything wrong. Hey, I just, I got this email, said you bought two guns. If you buy more than two guns, you know, that's a lot, and we have to check that it's not a straw man purchase. So, you know, hey, how you, I'm your buddy. Just go get the guns and show me. If you got them in your possession, that's cool. We'll leave. You know, you're not in trouble, man. It's all cool. So, you know, it, it, he's trying to be, you know, it's the, it's the jackboot with a heart, right? He's trying to be uh, friendly and disarming. And of course, uh, the reason for that is it puts social pressure. You're the asshole. If you say, get out of my house, get off of my property, go get a warrant, right? I'm not a lawyer. So I don't know if there's some law that I'm unaware of that the ATF can just show up at your door without a warrant and demand to see your guns. I'd be surprised if such a law existed, but, uh, I don't know what the hell's going on in Delaware. Uh, it's likely unconstitutional, but what does the ATF care? Uh, so I, I think the proper response here should be, uh, thank you for not shooting my dog. Go get a warrant. Right. I mean, that this guy doesn't do this. Uh, this guy actually. Um, but here's the ATF. Look, you can unload them and bring them out. We can go out. To your foyer here, check him out, right? Serial numbers down. You can he would say he was like, Oh, you can even close the door. You don't you can leave us on the porch. It's okay. It'll take five seconds. The other ATF agent interjected. Yeah. The reason we're out here is obviously gun violence is at an uptick. We want to make sure, you know, we've been having a lot of issues with straw purchases, and you bought two, so that's a large number. Um, and I guess you know, in fairness for ATF agents, two maybe is a large number uh for counting, but um you know, they, uh, you know, disarmingly nice, blah, blah, blah. Um, hey, we don't blame you. But the guy goes and gets his, uh, here, here's the end of this report. According to a report from Armed American News, which interviewed the unnamed Delaware homeowner after he retrieved one of his firearms and the agents matched the serial number to one on their paperwork. The warrantless gun cops were satisfied, not requesting to see any more. I think any more should be two words there, national file, but hey, I'm not your editor. They, quote, wished the homeowner a good night and left. Hey, thanks. Don't forget to Heil Hitler on your way out, guys. Good night. Heil to uh, the authoritarians and leave. That's what you expect from the ATF. So there you go. That's the ATF for you. Um, just just doing their job, just doing their job, you know, there's an uptick in gun violence, so we don't need a warrant, that's how that works, Greg the Baritone asks in chat if this is related to f red flag laws, no, and I mean, not that I can see from this, uh, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think so, uh, <laughs> He also says he should bring him a water pistol and his red rider. His red rider rider would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, ATF. 
<clears throat> for what, what can we thank the ATF for sincerely? I'm trying to think. Well, they didn't they didn't shoot a dog. Maybe he didn't have a dog, no. So all right. Um let's go over the Greenwood Greenwood Park Mall shooting. Uh, and just for those of you who haven't been paying attention, we'll go over a timeline here. So this was on Sunday afternoon. This was in Greenwood, Indiana, with a cleverly named Greenwood Park Mall located in Greenwood, Indiana. And uh, I guess I won't name the gunman. Uh, the gunman, age 20, he's from Greenwood. Uh, might come as a shock to some of you, but hey, he's from a broken home. Parents are divorced. Mom ended up uh, in a shelter at one point. Uh, at one point, he was supposed uh, allegedly, I guess, living in a week to week motel. His mom was in a custody battle uh, with his brother over his uh, custody of him. He spent time in a foster family. He didn't have any criminal history, but, you know, he's only 20. Uh, he did have a juvenile history of assault or something at school that happened. But uh, there you go. Oh, my. Wait, we have to pause because Judge Lott just sent me a super chat, which is hilarious. Uh I almost don't believe we got We should pull it up in real time. But Judge Lott says on a lighter night, someone edited Google Maps at the spot where Biden fell on his bike. They named it Brandon Falls. <laughs> I, I'm surprised Google doesn't have like a can you do that? Can Google just wouldn't Google remove that here? I'm going to go look up Brandon Falls. This is a relaxed show today. I'm in a mood. I'm just in a good, relaxed mood. I spent the morning at uh, the rifle range which always puts me in a good mood. I don't, you know, what do you hear? Brandon Falls. No, if you search for it, it's it's not showing up in search, but that doesn't mean that that's not true. Maybe it just doesn't show up in search or they've removed it already because God forbid uh, someone mock the <laughs> geriatric pile of bones covered in skin suits. Uh, a skin suit, maybe multiple skin suits. All right. Uh, so that's this guy. Broken family, as you might expect. He brings two rifles and a pistol into the mall. I think he left one of the rifles in the bathroom or whatever. But he comes in. He he comes in and 100 rounds. They say 100 plus rounds of ammo. Like, that's a lot. Uh, it's got to be more. Who brings only 100 plus rounds of ammo with, like, two rifles and a pistol? Uh, like, that's just not enough. Um whatever. So some ammo more than a hundred, which I guess is a big number. Uh, oh, someone said he's a cancer patient as well. Zero fuck says that. Okay. I didn't know. Okay. So right before 5 PM, he goes into the mall, goes to the bathroom near the food court. He comes out like an hour later. So some IBS going on. He comes out an hour later and he emerges from the restroom with his rifle and he proceeds to fire 20 shots. He kills three people and injures uh, a few others here. Um, but within 15 seconds, which I think is pretty, pretty impressive, uh, a 22 year old named Elisha Dickin, regular civilian dude, uh, carrying concealed constitutional carry, carrying concealed, um, he sees what's going on, and within 15 seconds, fires back. Uh, I've seen conflicting reports that he fired 24 shots, and some that say he fired 10 shots in 15 seconds, whatever. He hit him eight times, but that's not the impressive. I mean, that's impressive, I guess. But he hit him from I, what I was seeing, and I don't know if they were confusing feet or yards, but from 40 to 50 yards is what is being reported, which is, uh, that's good, man. I mean, I don't know if you've ever gone to the range with a pistol. You try and hit something at 50 yards with the pistol, pistol especially a, a moving target the size of a human, that's that's pretty good. I hear he braced himself against a, a pole or something to do it, but still, or a wall, that's pretty impressive. Nice job, Elisha. Anyway, saved a bunch of people's lives. Uh including a, including a 12-year-old who was injured, but 
you know, may have had worse happen to her. To her. Um, so, yeah. Raphael says 40 yards. Yeah, it's impressive, right? Zero Fox says he heard 8 out of 10 at 40 yards. Yeah, I saw an 8 out of 10, but another report said 24 shots, so I just don't know what to believe. But even if it's 8 out of 24 in 15 seconds, that's a lot because that's a reload uh, with a pistol. So it's probably 8 out of 10. Regardless, I, his first shot landed. Uh, that That seems to be clear. So, hey. First round hit 40 yards away with a pistol, under stress, with adrenaline. Pretty good. So, good Elijah. Now, of course, most of the immediate responses from the community were, oh, someone says the bad guy had a bunch of extra rounds on him too. Yeah, of course. I mean, he only fired 20. They said he had 100 plus. I think 100 is a low number. So, yeah, I'm sure he had a whole bunch. Uh and he was just, he was warming up. So, of course, the, the community, you would expect healthy responses, and you get healthy responses from people who are, are glad that they're, more of their fellow community members were not shot. Uh, the Greenwood Police Department chief, Jim Ison, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, he called him a good Samaritan. He said, quote, the real hero of the day is the citizen that was lawfully carrying a firearm in that food court and was able to stop the shooter almost as soon as he began. He goes on to say, his actions were nothing short of heroic. He engaged the gunman from quite a distance with a handgun, was very proficient in that, was tactically sound. And as he moved to close in on the suspect, he was also motioning for people to exit behind him. This guy's cool. Uh, Ison said about Dickens' actions, many people would have died last night if not for a responsible armed citizen that took action very quickly within the first two minutes of the shooting. And I think, you know, after he said this, it came out, it was within 15 seconds. So, yeah, it's impressive. Uh, the Greenwood mayor, Mark Myers, says, quote, this person saved lives tonight. On behalf of the city of Greenwood, I'm grateful for his quick action and heroism in this situation. Yeah, undoubtedly. Enter Twitter. So the community is thankful. Twitter, not so much. Especially the leftist Twitter, the check marks. They're less thankful uh, for Elijah's intervention. Um, you know, these are the gun tyrants. Uh, you know, the seething, <laughs> bitter, malevolent, misanthropic gun tyrants. By the way, why I call them gun tyrants, I don't want to call them gun control advocates or mentally challenged Harvard grads or anything like that. The reason I want to, the, the reason I like calling them gun tyrants is, um, let's just look at some basic facts. There's, there's no such thing as eliminating guns from American society. There's 450 million guns circulating and lots of 3D printers uh, and porous borders with guns coming across borders. So um, these these gun tyrants, they're not advocating that we eliminate all guns. That's not what gun control advocates, as they like to be called, That's or, or gun safety advocates, sometimes they like to be called. They're not advocating that we eliminate all guns, that we like wave a magic wand and zap all the guns or invent a, a gun-eating bacteria, right? Um, They, they're not doing that because they need guns. They don't want guns to go away. First of all, they need to send them to Ukraine at the very least, right? I mean, how can you, you can't put a Ukrainian flag in your Twitter profile without supporting the sending of firearms to Nazis in Ukraine. So uh, you got to have them for that. Also, um, if they were advocating to just eradicate all guns, we could have that discussion, right? We could have a discussion about how, you know, trying to stuff innovation back into the box from which it came is a impossible and b counterproductive i mean it's impossible you can't they can't even keep drugs out of prisons right D drugs that are quite difficult and dangerous to chemi chemically synthesize i mean some of the stuff you know <laughs> open up a private browser at starbucks without a camera watching you someday and like look up how to uh just how to process cocaine it's not like easy 
Look up how to make crystal meth. I, I, it's not simple. Can't stop that. Removing 500-year-old technology from reality is a bit more difficult than, than keeping drugs out of prisons, and we can't even do that, right? And obviously, manufacturing is getting easier. So it's A, it's impossible. B, it's counterproductive, right? Um, because whenever, if you remove a piece of technology from society, the criminal element, i.e. the element that doesn't give a crap about your rules, becomes experts in the state of the art of that technology because other people aren't doing it. So it becomes there. So it's you know, to try and do that as the willful denial of a reality and the requirements for surviving in it. So to say that you would want to eliminate all guns is kind of saying like, it's equivalent of saying, let's set a speed limit for animals at one mile an hour, right? And then we'll pretend like the lion's not going to break it. That's, that's not going to go well, right? So they're not, they're not actually asking for the elimination of guns, which is why they're not uh, gun prohibitionists or gun control advocates or whatever, they are gun tyrants. What they're advocating for is a monopoly on guns in the hands of government. That's what they're advocating. They want guns, obviously, in the military because um, you can't shoot people in the Middle East with, if you're unarmed. Uh, they want guns in the CIA because you can't, uh, I guess you can't run drugs and uh, initiate coups and fund terrorists very easily if you don't have guns. So the CIA needs them. The FBI needs them. Uh, I'm sure uh, Peter Strzok and his lover probably use them for some sort of kink play. So the FBI needs guns. Uh, the Department of Agriculture gets guns. EPA gets guns. Local cops get guns. Nancy Pelosi's bodyguard gets guns. All those people, they're not advocating that those people don't get their guns. They're advocating that you and I don't get to have guns. That's not gun control. That's gun tyranny. They're gun tyrants. So and that was an aside. Sorry about that. <laughs> Beverly wants to know how to process cocaine. I'm not going to teach you how to process cocaine. Uh, okay. So we have some typically seething responses from some gun tyrants. Let's look them up. Let's just let's just look at some some of my favorites here on Twitter. Let's see if I can do a screen share again. Beverly's here, but she's not helping me. That's her new thing. She just shows up. Okay. Oops, that's the wrong one. How do I do? How do I do this one? I don't know. I don't know why here. I'm going to stop sharing this one. <sighs> Sometimes I feel like a boomer. You know, I'll just share the whole screen. That's easier. Rather than a window. Okay. So... Boom. If you think that only three, so this is from Aaron Weiss. He's a blue check deputy director slash podcaster. Oh, damn it. Slash data cruncher at worst room priorities. Uh, okay. If you think that, quote, only three people died because a good guy with a gun showed up, end quote, is a good outcome, then you need to seriously recalibrate. I don't think there was a pun intended there. Your morality. Although, Kudos if there was a pun intended on recalibrate. I give him some credit for that, but I don't think he's that smart. Uh, so, so that's what he says. Now, this is 100%. Here, I'll put it back up. We don't need to take it down. This is 100% dishonest, uh, clearly. Um, no one is happy that there's mass shootings, and he knows this. So this is just dishonest. Uh, and, and more generally, just to remind the left, because sometimes I need to remind it of this stuff. No one's actually happy that there are mass murderers generally, regardless of what implement they're using. We, we don't like mass murderers. Uh, mostly actually leftists do. You tend to, to like the, you know, Stalins and the Mao's of the world, uh, and the Che, you're the guys who wear Che Guevara shirts. We're not really, the rest of us really aren't fans of mass murder just generally. So we're not super happy when mass murder happens. Right. Um, it's kind of a problem when someone decides to try and kill as many other people as possible. You know, whether they're using a gun or, I don't know, let's just come up with a random example. Driving a truck through a, a Christmas parade, something like that. 
right? Both bad. Uh, so the method's not the problem, right? I'm not really pissed at trucks and truck drivers. Uh, that's not really the problem. The problem is the mass murderer. That the mass murdering is a problem. Maybe we should focus on that problem and not disarm the victims to save them. It's for your own good. Uh, you know, and as as with most leftist uh, sloganeering, <laughs> most of their activism, this is motivated by projection. Right? We don't need to recalibrate our morality. This person, Aaron, Aaron, it's you who needs to recalibrate your morality. Because being a liar is immoral. Fabricating the idea that advocates for individual rights are happy about mass shootings in order to push your ill-conceived political agenda is, in fact, bad. It is immoral. You, perhaps, ought to consider recalibrating your pathetic excuse for morality. Let's do another one. Sarah Reese here. Let's take a look at Sarah Reese's response. Sarah Reese Jones. Sarah Reese Jones. Hey, another another blue check. What are the odds? Sarah Reese Jones. Uh, she says, let's see who it is. Politicus Sarah. That's her handle. So that's right away. Smells fishy. She's the boss. She's a boss at Politicus USA. An award-winning producer. Hey, look, she's a member of SAG. Who would have thought? And Rick Perry called her scandalous trash, which she wears as a bag of honor. A badge of honor. Or a bag of honor. Maybe there's bags of honor. Anyway, Sarah has this to say. She says, Greenwood Park Mall this time, just days after Governor Eric Holcomb's new law that eliminates the license requirements to carry a handgun went, to, went into effect on July 1st. Because Republicans think that this country needs more guns and less responsibility. I mean, do they not have IQ tests at Politicus? I guess. Well, she's the boss, so maybe. Um, we know they don't have them at SAG. So um, it's almost as if these people are angry that the shooter was stopped because he wasn't stopped by the right people. Like, it would be okay if he were stopped by agents of the state. But, you know, not not private citizens. Would have been much better for cops to show up and wait around for an hour and debate whether to go inside, I guess. Again, look, this is 100% dishonest. This is the kind of reaction we're seeing. The implication here, let's just look at how absolutely inverted this is. The implication here is that the shooter waited until after July 1st so he could legally carry a rifle into a mall and shoot people. So the shooter's like, you know, I'd really love to kill a bunch of people. I'll mass murder some people. But the problem is I'm not allowed to carry my rifle into the mall. I should wait. You know, I hear there's a new law that goes into effect on July 1st. I'll wait because that law allows me to. Oh, wait. No, I don't think the law does allow me to bring my rifle in and kill people. But whatever. It allows something unrelated well kind of re like other people could conceal carry i guess i don't know it allows something i'm gonna wait till that's the that's the thought process i'm gonna wait till july 1st um and of course the conclusion that a a <laughs> reasonable person would draw from this uh license requirement to carry a handgun getting lifted is that hey it's lucky that there was a good person there who is capable of stopping the bad guy. Eliminating these license requirements might have helped. Maybe, maybe he wouldn't have been there. Maybe Elijah, I don't know, maybe Elijah wouldn't have been there. That's what a reasonable person that reads this and goes, oh, maybe Elijah wouldn't have been there. I didn't know there was license requirements that went away. But instead, Sarah, of course she's blonde. I can make blonde jokes because I'm Sarah says she she concludes the opposite. 
She thinks that making it easier for law-abiding citizens to carry somehow helped the shooter in his quest. The shooter who was killed, whose rampage was stopped. It helped him that Elijah was there to take him out within 15 seconds. That's, that's her thought process. That's how her neural pathways connect. Obviously, she's either mentally handicapped, which I doubt, or she's just dishonest. Um, and we should be calling out this kind of dishonesty with vigor. I'm so sick of this. We let people get away with this, we, and then we get into arguments with them. This is not even a reason to argue with this kind of a person. She's just a dishonest cunt. This is just dishonest. Really. I mean, look, I know ad hominem is not an argument. I, I'm not making an argument. I'm saying this is anyone with two neurons that are connected and any honest bone in their body looks at this and says, she's dishonest. I'm not engaging in you. You're with you. You're dishonest. Lying works better when, when people let you get away with it. And lying, by the way, philosophically, lying is, is an assault on your ability to live. It's a milder form of initiation of the use of force. It's misrepresenting reality. That can sound like a little thing, but when you're when we're talking about like actual philosophy, living here on Earth, how humans can live on Earth, you rely on your understanding of reality in order to survive and to make decisions that are best for you. So when someone comes along and misrepresents reality, they deceive you. It's a sort of a theft of your ability to navigate reality. And that's what she's doing. And then she adds this less responsibility. Republicans think this country needs more guns and less responsibility. I mean, look, I can't speak for Republicans, thankfully. But again, uh, this is a complete inversion and that's completely dishonest. Individualists, pro-liberty, pro-Second Amendment people know that. Liberty is inherently tied to and concomitant with responsibility, right? With liberty comes responsibility. They go together. You can't have one without the other. Well, I guess you could be given responsibility without the liberty. That's slavery. Um, but you want liberty, you need to accept responsibility. And, and individualists know this. The phrase individual responsibility almost completely sums up the entire liberty mindset. Not quite, but almost. And she's like, they think that they want less responsibility. What are you talking about, Sarah? What she's talking about is lying. She's just lying. She's just lying. She's just a liar. On the other hand, by the way, gun tyrants like Sarah Reese Jones uh, have nothing to do with responsibility. They don't want responsibility. One of the most irresponsible things you can do is to give all the guns to the government and cross your fingers. Democide, I think, killed more people in the 20th century uh, than anything else. I mean, other than old age, you know, natural death. But like, democide, what, over 100 million people were killed by their own governments? Abdicating responsibility to the state is not responsible. <sighs> okay, let's do one more. <laughs> Konstock says it's possible to be a cunt and a retard at the same time you know I stand corrected <laughs> she may be both I suspect she's not though uh, I suspect she's just one you can guess uh, all right and here's another this is an old political cartoon but it's been being shared around uh, lately in, in response to this thing. So let's take a look at this. This is from the Santa Cruz Sentinel. I think this guy, though, is from the Washington Post, this cartoonist. And I guess I'll explain this for people listening. It shows the Grim Reaper, and he's got two columns, one on the left and one on the right. The headline of this cartoon says, For Those Keeping Score. And on the left, the the... the title of the left-hand column is Mass Shootings in America, and the title of the right-hand column is Mass Shootings Stopped by a Good Guy with a Gun. They put good guy with a gun in quotes because that's funny to them. Uh, it's all ironical 
I don't know why they put it in quotes, but okay. They put it in quotes. So, on the left, oh, and in the left hand column, mass shootings in America, there's like a few hundred uh, hash marks, and there's on the right hand side, there's one. Gotcha. You're so smart. Cartoonist Nick Anderson. What a great point you make. So this has been floating around in response because, you know. Now this cartoon, look, he presents this as if uh, people opposed to gun tyranny, <laughs> i.e. liberty-minded people, are so stupid or maybe just evil that we're choosing the column on the right at the expense of the column on the left. We're like, yeah, it's okay. All that bloodshed on the left is fine. We just want that check mark on the right. That's the kind of people we are. We're happy to have more bloodshed of innocent people so long as once in a while a bad guy is stopped by a good person. What we want, and you saw this phrase used a lot this week uh, in reference to the, uh, the Greenwood Mall shooting, Greenwood Park Mall shooting. You saw, you know, they want the OK Corral. They want the Wild West, right? Now, this political cartoon is the intellectual equivalent of, if you don't agree with me, you're a Nazi who wants to eat babies. I mean, that's that's what this is. It's childish. It's pathetic. It's anti-intellectual. Uh, it's anti-cognition. Um, it's 100% emotional, 0% rational. It's not worthy of being called an opinion. Uh, this is emotional vomit. That's what this is. So let's just talk about, let's have a, I want to talk about a, I have a general, general response to gun tyrants. I don't know what it is, but the, the, the gun control, the gun tyrants, they've been around for a while, my whole life. You know, there's always been some version of David Hogg, although he is special. Um, there's always been, there's always been some, some version of David Hogg. I just was kind of used to it and, uh, numb to it, I guess. But, uh, it's really starting to piss me off more and more. Um, so look, let's let's just start with the basics here. The, the principle of individual sovereignty requires, requires not like in a rule book written down, but like in the way that the laws of physics require that force equals mass at times acceleration. The principle of individual sovereignty requires the right to self-defense. Self-defense is a derivative right. It's a derivative right. You don't have individual sovereignty if some group of uh, thugs with guns won't let you own and use the tools to protect yourself from violence that others might attempt to inflict on you including violence that those thugs might attempt someday. Not like history has ever seen governments turn on their people, but, you know, theoretically. Uh, and, you know, I want to make I want to make a note also on policing while we're on this subject. I saw one of the guys at the range, one of the old timers at the range had the had a hat and on the back, was it the back of his hat or back of his jacket, whatever. It had the blue, the, the American flag with the blue, the thin blue line thing. I get it. I know there's a lot of conservatives at gun ranges. Um, so I want to make a note on policing here. Moral authority is what matters, not legal authority. Right? You, you, you respect law enforcement. If you want to be virtuous, you respect law enforcement only to the extent that officers limit their behavior to the morally justified. Every action that they take is the use of force. By virtue of their position, right? They're they're entitled to use force against you, right? That's so their presence is uh, a, a right away a threat. Like disobedience is a threat. Like you know that you 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 know what the consequences will be, right? So every action they take is bound up with this this use of force. And I'm not saying that's wrong. It's kind of the way it has to be if you're going to have police. Like everything they do is bound up with this use of force. Now. If they're attempting to stop or apprehend a murderer, 
a rapist or a thief, let's assume that they're not actually standing outside the school, but going in and doing something. If they're doing something like that, they're morally justified, right? The response uh, to the initiation, the responding to the initiation of the use of force, right? And you could argue about what responses are justified and what they should do, but in general, in principle, they're morally justified by doing this. But if they're using their their force, which is all, that's the tool they have. That's what makes them police, right? As opposed to dudes who wear costumes and carry guns around. What makes them police is their legal ability to use force, right? Um, if they're using that force to enforce a mask mandate, implement gun control laws, show up at your house and demand to see your serial numbers of your guns, collect taxes, those things are not moral uses of force. They're the initiation of the use of force. So police are agents of the state. And they're your friend or your enemy of liberty. They're, they're the friend or enemy of liberty to the extent that the state is a friend or enemy of liberty. That's it. There's no, the difference between a cop in America and a cop in China is the state, right? It's, it's, it's what they stand for. It's what they do. It's what the state asks them to do. That's the difference. All right. So philosophically, look, you have a right. This is intrinsic to your right to, to the individual sovereignty. You need the right to defend yourself from random psychopaths, as in Greenwood. And you need the right, by the way, to defend yourself from organized psychopathy, as in Washington. Now, the gun tyrants always dismiss or hand wave the long-term risk of a government monopoly on the tools of combat. Always. As I mentioned, democide, I think, was the largest killer in the 20, unnatural killer in the 20th century. This is not a risk that you can ignore or pretend exists only in the heads of crazy paranoid gun nuts. I mean, you can, but that makes you a tool of evil. And gun tyrants always ignore or dismiss or minimize or even ridicule the risk of granting a monopoly there to the state. Always. Because if they didn't dismiss, they have no arguments for it. So if they didn't just dismiss it out of hand and laugh at, laugh at it, they would be stumped. So they need to just dismiss it. And this right that you have to self-defense is inextricably linked to your right to individual sovereignty. You can't abandon that right to self-defense and pretend that you respect individual rights. And this is why the Second Amendment is there. Right? I mean, there was arguments about what whether to put the amendments in at all and all that kind of stuff. But look at the difference in power between the First and Second Amendments of the Constitution. And everyone, everyone views these amendments as kind of equal. They're not. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's a limitation on Congress. These are what you can't. doesn't say states can't. Now, states shouldn't, right? And some state constitutions, I think, do enshrine the right to free speech. But the Constitution doesn't say that Florida can't limit the right to free speech. It just doesn't say that. You might want it to. I might want it to. It doesn't. It says Congress shall make no law. That's what it says. That's the wording they chose. What did they choose for the Second Amendment? Does it say Congress shall make no law abridging the right to bear arms? No, it doesn't. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. Anyone who is not completely dishonest knows that militia does not mean the state militia. And you know you know what well-regulated meant at the time. Also doesn't matter because that's the background, the comma, and then the rest of the sentence, which is the uh, <laughs> actual action part of the sentence, the imperative part. The imperative part of the Second Amendment says 
the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It doesn't say Congress won't shouldn't pass a law. It doesn't say, you know, uh, the president shouldn't pass an executive order. Shall not be. That's a lot stronger than Congress shall not pass a law. That maybe implies that Florida can't infringe that. Florida doesn't do too bad of a job, but so I shouldn't be picking on them. Anyway, so since so so those are the principles we've talked about the principle I've talked about principled right to self defense in the past, but since the long term principled thinking thing isn't the forte of blue check marks on Twitter, let's take a look at how things like this cartoon um, specifically are dishonest propaganda. Uh, let's just here I'll I'll put it back up for a sec. So you can take a look. Now, first of all, this trivializes the this trivializes the number of times guns are used to stop violent crimes. I mean, it's not often in the news. The news doesn't like to report on this stuff. But uh, just a few weeks ago, I got was maybe it was the end of May. I don't know, like in Charleston, West Virginia. A woman uh, used a firearm to kill a dude who was on a rampage with an AR-15. The name, uh, I guess I won't name the guy, but um, she pulled out a pistol and killed him. So he, let's see, this is a quote from Police Lieutenant Tony Hazlett with the Charleston Police Department. Quote, a law-abiding citizen who stopped the threat of probably 20 or 30 people getting killed. She engaged the threat and stopped it. She didn't run from the threat. She engaged it, preventing a mass casualty event here in Charleston. We all remember the December 2019 Texas church shooter that stopped uh, by uh, by a person with uh, carrying concealed in church. And the broader point here is that and we'll we'll talk about stats in a second, but a broader point here is that counterforce is almost always necessary to stop predators. Almost always, they don't they don't predators don't stop until they're forced, forced to stop. Right? Sometimes the mere presence of police forces them because they they realize they're going to be shot at or taken into custody and then, you know, commit suicide or something. But sometimes more than the presence of police is required. Sometimes they have to engage and, uh, and, and they need to be killed to be stopped. But it's not, it's not the badge that stops the shooter. It's the counter force. The shooter's not like, Oh, this person has a certain costume, therefore, I will stop. It's the counterforce that stops the shooter. And that counterforce, when delivered by anyone, is a good thing. It's a good thing. You want, when there's initiation of force, when a mass shooter starts shooting innocent people, you want counterforce. It doesn't matter where it comes from. You want counterforce. But the cartoonist here would suggest that, you know, the contribution of the armed citizenry is this de minimis contribution to uh, helping rid the world of mass shooters, to help minimize the impact of mass shooters. Right. One little tick. I'll put the cartoon back up. One little tick as opposed to all these others. And of course, if you this cartoonist probably doesn't do any digging or thinking, probably just reads the mainstream media like, well, I only remember one story and I researched all the mass shootings so that's how it is um but look let's look up instead of turning to someone like john lott or other pro-gun sources let's turn to to a report commissioned by the obama administration i don't think a lot of people will accuse me of turning to uh, pro-gun biased sources by citing work commissioned by the obama administration Let's look at a paper. This paper is called, here, I'll show you the paper. It is called 
firearm related violence. Actually, it's called Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm Related Violence. Uh, published by the Committee on Priorities for a Public Health Research Agenda to Reduce the Threat of Firearm Related Violence, blah, 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 blah. Now, let's, let me just show where this report came from. People are going to be like, this is not from Obama. Blah. Okay, let's look. We'll look over here from page 12. I'm just going to read what this report is. To help minimize future firearm-related deaths, President Obama issued 23... By the way, this report is from 2013. Uh, President Obama issued 23 executive orders directing federal agencies to improve knowledge of the causes of firearm violence with interventions that prevent firearm violence and strategies to minimize the public health burden of firearm violence. One of these executive orders, action number 14, noted that, quote, in addition to being a law enforcement challenge, gun violence is also a seriously pu serious public health issue that affects thousands of individuals, families, and communities across the nation, end quote. This order directed the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, along with other relevant, I, by the way, it always pisses me off when the CDC has anything to do with firearms, but okay. This, this order directed the CDC, along with other relevant federal agencies, to immediately begin identifying the most pressing research problems in firearm-related violence with the greatest potential for broad public health impact. Based on this directive, the CDC and the CDC Foundation requested that the Institute of Medicine, author of this report, in collaboration with the National Research Council, author, author of this report, identify questions that would define a public health research agenda for firearm violence prevention and intervention. Broadly, the committee was charged with identifying the most critical research questions in the following areas, the characteristics of firearm violence, risk and protective factors, interventions and strategies, gun safety technology, the influence of video games, <laughs> which I think is funny. So what did the Obama administration commissioned report? What did this report have to say about the defensive use of firearms? Does it look like this, hey, they're a drop in the bucket. You can ignore them. They're just a right-wing talking point. Is that what it says? Let's take a look. Here we are on page, what, 15 or so of the report. I'm just going to read this section. This section is called Defensive Use of Guns. Defensive use of guns by crime victims is a common occurrence, although the exact number remains disputed. I'm skipping over the citations, but you can read them on the screen if you want. Almost all national survey estimates indicate that defensive gun uses by victims are at least as common as offenses used, offensive uses by criminals. Defensive gun uses by victims are at least as common as offensive uses by criminals with estimates of annual uses ranging from about 500,000 to more than 3 million. And then for context, they help us out. They say, in the context of about 300,000 violent crimes involving firearms in 2008. So they're saying almost all the surveys estimate that it's used to prevent crime between a half a million and 3 million times but there's really only 300,000 violent crimes that are completed. That's not a drop in the bucket. Now, of course, there's a down, there's a, a low end estimate here. On the other hand, some scholars point to a radically lower estimate of only 108,000 annual defensive uses based on the National Crime Victimization Survey. Now, by the way, even if it's only 108, it's out of 300,000, it's still a third. The variation in these numbers remains a controversy in the field. That's true. The estimate of 3 million defensive uses per year is based on an extrapolation from a small number of responses taken from more than 19 national surveys. The former estimate of 108,000, this is the low end one, is difficult to interpret because respondents were not asked specifically about defensive gun use. Yeah, I guess difficult to interpret would be one way to describe it. It sounds like maybe unrelated. I don't know. I didn't dig into it, but sure. Okay. So. Look, the point is here, regardless of whether it happens 100,000 times or 3 million times, but you can't deny, pithy little Washington Post artist, is that it happens a lot. 
it is effective. Now, we just looked over some summary of some stats here. Statistics are actually irrelevant here. They support us in this case. They support they support this argument that uh, it is actually impactful. It does make a difference in defending yourself, that it does help prevent violent crimes. But you really don't need statistics. And they're often used in cases like this to obfuscate rather than clarify. You don't need statistics to make the case that guns help that, that having a gun helps prevent a crime. Like if the victim has a gun, it helps prevent a crime. You don't, you don't need stats for that. All you need is intellectual honesty. You just need to, like, if a violent criminal armed with a weapon confronted you with the intent to harm or kill you, would you prefer to be armed or unarmed? If guns don't help defend you, why do you arm soldiers in defensive wars? Why 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 doesn't why doesn't the Ukraine just not have any guns? And be like, well, we're not invading Russia, we're not on the offense, we're just defending. We don't need guns. Because they don't help in violent attacks, right? Why don't we just send the Ukrainians to the battlefield unarmed? Of course, guns are effective. That's the point. Everyone knows that. Right. People often try to throw statistics, statistics at you to try and complicate a rather simple matter. Being armed against a bad guy is better than not being armed against a bad guy. That's it. That's the point. That's the end of the argument. Nevertheless, we do have those interesting stats. The other thing this guy does, this cartoon dude. And I'm picking on him, even though it's old. I'm picking on him because it is it is being passed around, and it's kind of this is a common mentality. The other thing he does here is he's equating these two. He he has these in like he assumes that these left and right hand columns are two sizes, two sides of some kind of equation, right? They're, they're two sides of some like weird equation, as if well, making one side zero, making the right hand zero, makes the left side zero, right? And because we're unwilling to make the right side zero, because we want some good guys to be around with guns, therefore, we are allowing now this entire left-hand side to be here, right? So with this comes that. That's the that's the implication. There's like an equal sign sort of here. And he's criticizing by, by, by pretending these are on a balance. And that, you know, idiot liberty lovers are over here going, yeah. We really need this one thing at the expense of all of this stuff. That's the implication. And of course, that's not at all true. That is there's nothing to do with truth. That has nothing to do with truth. It's not a balance. It's not a scale. They're not, they're not equivalent. They're not related in that way. Gun laws will generally prevent good people from carrying. Right? Uh I mean, as I mentioned, the Greenwood Park Mall had a rule it was against the rules actually to carry in the greenwood park mall um i don't know what happens if you're legally carrying generally but you violate the rule of the mall i would assume that maybe you could just get kicked out of the mall like i don't think you go to jail for that i mean it seems like you you know I, I don't know you violate a rule you don't go to jail usually um but who knows uh but you know Passing gun control legislation, restricting gun ownership, uh, and restricting the right to carry does does often prevent good people from carrying. And maybe it shouldn't. It didn't prevent Elisha. At least the mall rule didn't. But maybe, maybe gun laws shouldn't prevent you. Maybe good people shouldn't be submitting to unconstitutional laws that restrict the right to carry. Because good but weak and ineffective is useless. If you're weak and ineffective, it doesn't matter that you're good, right? Good people should be dangerous people, not compliant pets of the state. They should be sheepdogs, not sheep. Because there are wolves out there, and sheep are worthless. Regardless, uh, I think many otherwise good people will chicken out when it comes to caring if caring is unlawful. 
unconstitutionally unlawful. I'm, I'm not saying the laws would be constitutional, but you will get fewer good guys with guns. So, so this, the number on the right, if you have more gun laws will go down, there'll be fewer people stopping mass shootings because you'll have fewer good guys with guns. Will you also have fewer bad guys with guns? Well, maybe some, right? Some mass murderers might have to drive their trucks into crowds at Christmas parades, right? Or run for office and start wars in the Middle East. I mean, that's, there's other ways to mass murder. I guess they will have to do that. But again, anyone who's being intellectually dishonest has to admit gun laws will not stop criminals from obtaining guns. As I mentioned earlier, we can't even keep illegal drugs out of prison, let alone off the streets. Guns are legal now. They're pretty easy to buy in stores. So here's a question. If guns are legal now and they're pretty easy to buy in stores. Hmm. Hmm. Are they. Are they used? Uh, the, the guns that are used for crimes, are they. Are they purchased in stores? Let's find out. We have stats. Here, I'll pull this up. All right. This is between, this is comparing 1997 to 2004. I don't have anything newer. Source of firearms possessed by state prison inmates at time of offense. Okay. In 1997, 37.3% of the source the guns came from illegal sources. For, in 20, 2004, 40% came from illegal sources. And then the other large majority comes from families or friends purchasing or bar, borrowing them or whatever. So here we are. We're in a world where it's actually pretty easy to buy a gun. Legally, and yet 40%, at least as of 2004, 40% are still illegal, <laughs> illegally obtained. So that left-hand column isn't going to go away. People who wanted, and by the way, mass shootings is a very small percentage of gun violence. The vast majority of gun violence will continue. You just won't have a good guy there. Because more good guys are going to chicken out. All right. Before I move on, uh, I think we got another super chat. Judge Lot says, "There's no such thing as public health, public sanitation, sure, but not public health." That phrase is just bureaucratic mumbo jumbo. Yeah, well, any phrase—I mean, you know this, Judge Lot. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but almost any phrase that uses "public" is uh, not really an philosophically accurate. It's usually used to corrupt something. Right. Public property means not private property, which means not property. Like there's no, own, no public property. There's no owner. It's it's not it's not owned. There's not a public ownership thing. That's no such thing. The public isn't an entity. Right. It's a bunch of people. So when people say public health, they usually mean like they they, they, they substitute statistics more for morality. So like this percentage of the people are better than blah, blah, blah. <sighs> but yeah, good point. Judge law. Okay. But even though we looked at those statistics there, I want to I do want to reiterate two points. Statistics aren't a principled approach to the question of whether the government should allow individuals to bear arms. Virtue requires operating on principles. It just so happens, by the way, that the most practical thing to do in the long term is the most principled thing, but it's in the long term. In the short term, they can conflict. So virtue requires operating on principles. Uh, and as I mentioned, statistics are often used to obfuscate rather than uh, clarify. Usually pretty simple observations that are inconvenient to certain political agendas, right? So if I said, I just want, the statistics thing's really bothering me because I, I, got, I got caught in a trap. Maybe I'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, if I said, look, looks play a role in who people choose as spouses, right? Obviously, for some people more than others, but whatever. Looks play a role. You don't need statistics to confirm that. You don't need P a PhD in sociology and you know Ivy League degrees to confirm that. You just 
look inward and you recall, hey, every time I've been in a relationship, looks have played a role. Every person I've ever talked to about relationships, looks have played a role. And you conclude, yeah, obviously looks play a role. It's just, it's one of these obvious things. It just it's you see it everywhere. Of course, looks play a role. Everyone knows that. Does it mean looks for everything? No, right? But obviously they play a role. Now, imagine that a Harvard researcher comes along who happens to be butt ugly. A butt ugly Harvard researcher comes along and she argues that no one actually cares about looks at all when choosing a spouse. That looks are not a factor. And she she gets grant money for this, of course. She produces study after study involving surveys of people and demographic analysis and double-blind hotness ratings from third parties. Just diving into the details of her research might make your head spin. But when you do, it's clear there's like, there's multivariate factors at play. She somehow... Uh, claims to be able to dismiss or ignore or explain these factors away so that she reaches this conclusion. Looks don't matter to anyone at all, ever, and they never have. That's her conclusion. You do not need to devote a year of your life to examining her research and pulling threads and questioning confidence intervals and implicit biases and looking at the loaded questions and the dubious assumptions. You just need to look at your own dating history and go, no, she's wrong. She's as wrong as if her papers concluded that gravity doesn't exist. She's just wrong. No amount of stats make that right. It is obvious to anyone who's remotely familiar with human nature and human social interaction. And in the same way, when people try to use statistics to argue that counterforce isn't effective in stopping violence, you don't need to get bogged down in the quagmire of statistical fog that they're selling. Just think of a member of MS-13 covered in his face tattoos with metal bits jingling as he sprints towards you menacingly with a machete. Would you like a Glock 48 right about now or not? That's the question. That's the end. You don't need statistics. Obviously, counterforce helps. So I said I got caught up in this. this I, got, I got pissed about statistics because I got caught up in this. Uh, there was these arguments about gun-free zones. Um, cause that cartoon was focusing on mass shootings and Greenwood Park Mall was gun quote gun-free, I guess, sort of. Um, and obviously a lot of the school shootings are in gun-free zones and that kind of thing. So I started to like, I was like, oh, I'm going to look to see if most mass shootings take place in gun-free zones and then I'll draw some conclusion and blah, 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 blah. Sometimes I'm a retard. <laughs> Um, so I started doing this. I'm like, I Columbine, Columbus nightclub shooting, Red Lake, Amish school shooting, Virginia Tech, Fort Hood, Aurora Theater, Orlando nightclub. I started looking at all these. And then, uh, you know, I noticed that actually most of these mass shootings are workplace shootings. They're typically gun free, but not always. Right. Um, some of these are out in public. Some of them are on hard targets like military bases. Right. And then, I, and then I stopped and I thought, wait a minute, what am I trying to prove? Am I looking through statistics to try to make a case about the motive of the shooter? That's not possible. Statistics are never going to tell us, like, the reason that they choose venues. That's not possible. And no one is arguing that gun-free zones actually create mass shootings. But that's the straw man that that the left often debunks. They're like, they'll, they'll trot out all these stats about how gun-free zones don't cause mass shootings. Yeah, no shit. No one said that they cause mass shootings. What people are arguing correctly is that all else being equal, predators pick gun-free zones. Now, look, most of the time, all things aren't equal. Most of the reasons that mass murderers go out and do their mass shooting is They've got personal reasons they got a gripe against. And a lot of it is work, right? So they probably have gripes against employees or, or sorry, employers or whatever, or coworkers. There's a lot of personal reasons for picking a target. But gun-free zones 
are a factor. And to deny that is to deny reality. We don't need stats for it. If someone wants to commit suicide, they just commit suicide. They don't go shoot up a school first. So if they're engaged in a mass shooting, they want to achieve something. It's a horrific something, but they, they have a plan in mind. They have a goal. And they want to achieve that goal before someone throws lead into their brain pan. They want the death and destruction of whatever target they're going after first, even if they're planning to die eventually. They've got a goal. And, you know, you don't need statistical evidence for that because that's obvious. That's why they're there doing that. Getting shot 15 seconds into your shooting spree by a dude in the mall who has a CCW is not your plan. But if we want evidence, it's staring us in the face. Uh, look, let's just read a couple lines from the Buffalo Shooters Manifesto. He tells us very clearly, and this is common. Here's his manifesto. <sighs> New York has heavy gun laws, so it would... I'm, this is, I'm going to read it verbatim, although it's, there's grammar problems. New York has heavy gun laws, so it would ease for me if I knew that any legally armed civilian was limited to 10-round magazines or cocked firearms. Here he is again, a little bit later. Um, he's got some, some goals, one of his goals. To minimize the chance of instant death from a CCW holder, police, or general armed citizen. He's going to wear body armor. So that, that's a threat he's worried about. Attacking in a weapons-restricted area may decrease the chance of civilian backlash. Schools, courts, or areas where CCW are outlawed or prohibited may be good areas of attack. Areas where CCW permits are low may also fit this category. Areas with strict gun laws are also great places of Attack. Yeah, they tell you. You kind of don't need to be told this should be obvious, but they tell you. And by the way, if you want to go back to facts, uh, sorry, back to back to stats. Let's go back here. Let's find some more stats here. Here we go. Sixty percent of convicted felons admitted that they avoided committing crimes when they knew the victim was armed. Forty percent of convicted felons admitted they avoided committing crimes when they thought the victim might be armed. Felons report that they avoid entering houses where people are at home because they fear being shot. Fifty-nine percent of the burglaries in Britain, which has tough gun control laws, are quote hot burglaries, which are burglaries committed while the home is occupied by the owner slash renter. By contrast, in the U.S., with more lenient gun control laws, has a hot burglar burglarily burglary rate. Can't talk today of only thirteen percent. Washington D.C. has essentially banned gun ownership since nineteen seventy six, and has a murder rate of fifty six point nine per one hundred thousand across the river. Arlington, Virginia, gun ownership is less restricted. There, the murder rate is 1.6. Now, there's other factors there, probably. A survey of felons revealed the following. 74% of felons agreed that, quote, one reason burglars avoid houses when people are at home is that they fear being shot during the crime. 57% of felons polled agreed criminals are more worried about meeting an armed victim than they are about running into the police. So we got the stats as well, but you don't need them. Of course, criminals avoid armed victims. Their goal is not to get killed. It's to commit the crime. If their goal was to get killed, they would attack a police station with a BB gun. There's plenty of ways to get shot. <laughs> Zero fuck says it never seems to happen at a range. Yeah. Yeah, no one at the gun range is worried that someone's going to start a mass shooting. <laughs> uh, I'm worried about idiots with negligent discharges, but that's a separate matter. Um, look, criminals and mass shooters, all else being equal, 
prefer soft targets over hard targets. That's why there are two different concepts. I mean, I don't think they came from the criminal world. They probably came from the military world. But that's why there are concepts of soft targets and hard targets. Everyone, good guys, bad guys, any other pronoun you want or gender, like everyone would prefer to attack a soft target instead of a hard target. That's how it goes. This is so obvious that anyone who forces you to spend time arguing about this point is dishonest. They're energy vampires. Like the guy from uh, What We Do in the Shadows, the glasses, the bald dude. They're energy vampires. They're wasting your time and distracting you from doing something productive with your time. They are bogging you down and with their pedantic drivel. They're taking you out of the game. You don't know it. You're being You're being benched. They're keeping you on the sidelines of the culture war by getting you to argue about this stuff. Call them out and move on. They're liars. They're liars. And remember that the left is all about gun control, gun tyranny. They're all about gun control only because they plan to be in charge of the state. When the left thinks that they're losing, even they go to the gun range. Look what happened during the Trump era. You had Antifa going to the gun ranges trying to learn how to shoot. You had videos. I mean, it, they were funny soy boy videos with ridiculous people doing ridiculous things with firearms. But they were, quote, training. I mean, it was like cosplay training. But they're training, right? They were, they want to learn how to use guns because they, you know, were whipped up into this frenzy believing that, you know, literally Hitler was elected and blah, blah, blah. When they don't think they're in power, suddenly they're about being armed. But the left, the progressives, and progressives are administrative state authoritarians. That, that's what progressives are. They have made a tremendous amount of progress in government at all levels in the past 130 years. And by I, progress here in quotes, they've infiltrated at all levels over the past 130 years. Their insistence that you disarm is directly proportional to how confident that they are that they're in control of the state apparatus. That's what it is. So when they're really pushing you to disarm, it's because they are very, very confident that they're in control of the state apparatus, which, by the way, makes holding on to your gun rights more important than ever. Because those are the people that you need the guns for. The leftist authoritarians, the administrative state authoritarians, the guys who are going to send the ATF to your door, those are the people you need guns for. Yeah, sure, once in a while some psychopath might come into the mall. But they're not the real threat. They've never been historically the real threat. It's your government. And if evil people take it over, it ceases to be a good government. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I gotta. I'm gonna. Hey, I'm gonna. I'll put this up on screen. It's not a super chat, but it's a good joke. And good jokes. Whitney Smith. Whitney Smith says, "What has 178 badges, 278 guns, and no balls?" And G Man. G Man shows up. Boom. The Uvalde Police Department. Good job, G Man. Uh. Whitney Smith, by the way, also says liberals are Marxists. Uh, now, may, I'll, I'll put that one aside. I kind of know what you mean. You're technically inaccurate, but I understand what you mean. Uh, it depends on what you mean by the word liberal. It depends on what you mean by the word Marxist. The modern left is have moved on from the classist Marxism, and they've gone to this different form of collectivism, blah, blah, blah. But essentially, yeah, they're collectivist authoritarians. Leftists are collectivist authoritarians. So... Uh, all right. That's, that's the, uh, that's my, that's my rant on the, the Greenwood Park Mall shooting. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse already. I, I mean, I've just, I'm really riled up about the gun control stuff lately. And I don't know, something about David, David Hogg's face. Okay. Uh, so breaking news. Socrates is dead. So there's a reason why I think this is is interesting. The nerds, the nerds, I know who you are. Some of you, you show up for the nerdy stuff. So welcome. You can stay here uh, and enjoy this. Um, 
Last week, I talked to Stephen Hicks, who who is a great philosopher. I think he's one of the best living philosophers. Um, now, now, what does that even mean? Living today, whatever. Now, not living in the past. That would be dead. Anyway, he's one of the best philosophers I know. Uh, and last week, I asked him basically what was the greatest threat to. I was using the phrase Western civilization, and he's been pushing back, which I accept. And I think he's he's more technically accurate, so I'm going to try and change. Um, he's been saying, well, you know, it, it's kind of bled out of the West right now. It's not just Western civilization. It's really the, the Enlightenment ideas that need to be saved, and they're not just in the West. And actually, in many parts of the West, they're not there anymore. So it, it's saying Western civilization is kind of uh, outdated. Anyway, I asked him what the biggest philosophical threat to that enlightenment ideology enlightenment ideas was and he talked about cynicism and he explained why he thought cynicism was a big a big threat uh now you could argue cynicism is is really more of a psychological disposition than a philosophy but there were cynics of cynic philosophers um just as a reminder in the oed i'm just going to read from the oxford english dictionary uh, I'm gonna read. I'll read the part that matters here. Dis, cynicism is a dis, disposed. If you're a cynic, you're disposed to believe in human sincerity or goodness. Sneering, right? It so uh, it's the idea that when someone acts in a purported value-driven or sincere way, you assume that they have an ulterior dark motive and you don't believe in their virtue. That's what being cynical is. Um, maybe you don't believe in virtue as such that, that no one has virtue, no one acts sincerely and from uh, virtuous motives. And uh, what Dr. Hicks said really struck me, and I thought about it because I struggle with cynicism. <laughs> I'm I'm the threat to the Enlightenment. I struggle with cynicism. I admit it one hundred percent. Um, and here's why I struggle with cynicism. Most people suck, or at least it seems that way when you're on Twitter. Let's put it that way. It seems that a lot of people are insincere and do have ulterior motives. And if you spend time on the internet, it seems like it's everyone. Now, when you spend time off the internet, actually, uh, <laughs> that balance starts to shift and you're like, eh. You know, the checkout lady's an idiot, but she seems sincere, right? Like, you, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't get that feeling if you don't spend a lot of time online. Um, but when you spend time online reading YouTube comments or Twitter or anything, it seems like people are just horrible and it's very tempting to become cynical. Um, so I'm going to tie this to play. Well, so look, I, now we're gonna, we're getting into the story of Socrates briefly here um, because it's it's it relates to this. I recently read Plato's Apology. Plato's Apology is um, the is basically Socrates' defense at his trial. So let me a little. I'll, I'll, this will be pretty quick. I'm not going to read a bunch of <laughs> Plato. Um, for those of you who were kind of unaware of the story of who Socrates really was. Uh, purport, you know, allegedly. I don't know that it's 100% sure he's uh, existed. But Socrates, first of all, Socrates uh, devoted his life to uh, philosophy and the pursuit of virtue. Um, he was allegedly told by an oracle at Delphi that he was the wisest man alive, and he took that to mean that um, no one really knows anything because he felt like he didn't know anything. He couldn't possibly be the wisest man alive. And that means um, that uh, kind of the knowledge that humans have is so insignificant. We really don't know anything. That was kind of his <clears throat> way of taking it. And But he started, he went around to, to quote, quote, wise men, people who are considered wise. And he started questioning them because he was like, well, this person must know. I don't know about virtue. This person must know. I don't know about truth. This person must know. I don't know about beauty. This person must know, right? So he started asking. And most of the people he asked were 
either sophists or orators, which the, for the purposes of this discussion, are basically the related same kind of thing. Um, and basically, the, these are people like Protagoras and Gorgias and Paulus and uh, Callicles and and Mino, and they they um, well, not all of them were teachers. Some of these were students interested in this stuff, but they they all claimed to be teaching argumentation. They charged money. They had schools. They charged money, and basically, they're teaching political rhetoric. They 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 would say, well. You know, send your sons to us, and we will teach them how to argue at, um, uh, at basically at court or at assembly. Right? We'll we'll teach them how to be very convincing in political rhetoric. It's the it's the art of of rhetoric, the art of speech. And you know, Socrates was he didn't draw a lot of conclusion. You know, Socrates isn't the kind of guy where he like says this is what virtue is or this is what we should do. He he just asks a bunch of questions all the time. So he's asking these people and then students who want to to pay these guys to learn. Um, he's asking and uh, he's saying, well, what do you actually teach? Sophists like that. One of the questions he's asking is, like, what do you actually teach? And like, what do you mean? We teach rhetoric. Right. And he's like, well, like a cobbler, like if, if, you, if a cobbler teaches, you know, making shoes and, and a chef teaches cooking. And so. You know, there's doctors and farmers. These are areas of specialties. Uh, specialties. Well, what what do you teach? And they they're like, well, you know, the art of convincing people and blah blah blah. And he and and they, you know, he he goes back and forth and kind of questions them a lot. And he's like, well, then you, you know, they talk about being able to convince people in assembly. And he's like, well, wouldn't you want like if you're debating how to build a bridge or something in assembly, wouldn't you want a bridge expert to win the argument about how to build a bridge, not someone who is just schooled in argumentation. It seems like the only use for this kind of oratory is if it's going to be used for justice, it doesn't have any use at all, right? Because like the person who knows the thing, like the, the, the truth should trump. And if it's being used for justice, you just need truth and an understanding of whatever you're talking about. Virtue, building a bridge, right? Uh, and if it's not being used for justice, then it's being used against justice. And you shouldn't use it. It's evil. Like, what if the bridge guy, you're you're having a discussion and assembly, and the bridge guy makes a point, but one of your trained orators is able to refute him, and the masses don't know. They kind of agreed that, like, well, the masses don't know. So they're kind of tricking them into doing the right thing. And and the the sophists and orators were frustrated as hell with Socrates. He's quite annoying. You could call him annoying, definitely. Uh, he just asked them questions all the time. He asked them, like, well, what is virtue? And he would often prove or demonstrate through dialogue that they didn't know what they were talking about. They would say, well, I'll teach, your, I'll teach people to be virtuous. And it'd be like, well, what is virtue? And they would get into this thing and it would be very clear that their expertise fell apart. Or I'll teach people about beauty. And he would ask questions and, you know, he made them look like fools. He was definitely a, a thorn in the side to the sophists who were running schools and getting rich, um, teaching this art of rhetoric, right? Um, and like I said, you could accuse him of being annoying. You couldn't accuse him of like being a profiteer. He was destitute. He didn't charge money. Um, he didn't go around teaching a bunch of stuff. He just went around asking questions. But he was fighting sophistry. He was not a sophist. He was fighting it. He thought this was horrible. He was only interested in truth and and understanding. And he was he seems to be genuinely like maybe you know and like and he and 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 he he wants someone to be helping him but these people that claim to have knowledge just fall flat and he he gets them in contradictions and he's he's constantly disappointed so this is socrates <laughs> thank g man says reminds me of someone i know yeah the annoying part um so anyway so this is Soc this is socrates this is his life. He's going around doing this. Along comes this dude. I'm not blaming this guy completely, of course. Aristophanes. You know what Aristophanes is? He's like the Saturday Night Live writers. He's a, he's a comic writer. And he writes plays. And one of the plays he writes is called The Clouds. And I know I'm supposed to appreciate, like, I read this and I'm like, I'm supposed to appreciate it. It's it's old and oh, it's very important literature and it's a play. I'm supposed to appreciate it. I fucking hate this guy. 
I don't think I don't think it's funny. Uh, maybe humor just sucked back then. I don't know. I don't think it's particularly funny. But what I hate about him is in his play, there is a character named Socrates. That character is the exact opposite of Socrates. That character is a sophist. He charges money. He makes proclamations. He talks like an idiot. And he teaches how to win arguments even when you're wrong, which is what sophists taught. He's the op he's literally the opposite of Socrates. And he's presented and made fun of in the clouds as a sophist. I'm just gonna I'm gonna so the the way it's set up is this guy's got a son and the son keeps getting into debt, and the guy wants to learn how to talk his way out of debt or have the son talk his way out of debt. He's gonna go to learn he's gonna he wants to go pay Socrates in the play to learn how to get out of debt because Socrates is great at argumentation. I'm just going to read you this because it so pisses me off. All right. He's talk he says he's talking to his son. They say they have two arguments in there. This is in in Socrates school. They say they have two arguments in there. Right and wrong they call them, and one of them, wrong, can always win its case even when justice is against it. Well, if you can learn this wrongful argument, then all of these debts I've run into because of you, I needn't pay anyone an obel of them ever. So that's the premise. Socrates is a loon in this thing and a sophist. So I can, I'm just imagine. I don't know what was happening in Greek culture in Athens at the time, but I'm imagining this like cultural impression of Socrates going around, thanks to Aristophanes. That's 180 degrees out of phase with who he was. In fact, a corruption of who he is because they made him his own enemy. Like he's the enemy, right? And Socrates goes on trial. He gets accused of offending the gods and corrupting the youth. He's basically accused of sophistry. And he has to defend himself. And one of the things he even references uh, uh, the comedy in his defense. Because he knows, and he says, look, he, um, I don't know if I even have, Let's see if I have a thing to read, I don't know if I even do. Mm. So he talks about how there's basically this unsubstantiated feelings-based attitude about him, partly as a result of things like Aristotle, people like Aristophanes and Sophists who have been bad mouthing him. And and it's these vague, these these vague impressions that he can't really fight. And he says, let's see. I think so here. Um Furthermore, the young men who follow me around of their own free will, those who have most leisure, the sons of the very rich, take pleasure in hearing people question. They themselves often imitate me and try to question others. I think they find an abundance of men who believe they have some knowledge, but know little or nothing. So he's kind of explaining himself. The result is that those whom they question, remember, questioning these people makes them angry because it makes them look like fools. Those whom they question are angry, not with themselves, but with me. They say, quote, that man Socrates is a pestilential fellow who corrupts the young. If one asks them what he does, so he's like evidence. If one asks them what he does and what he teaches to corrupt them, they are silent as they do not know. But so as not to appear at a loss, they mention those accusations that are available against all philosophers about, quote, things in the sky and things below the earth, end quote. And about, quote, not believing in the gods and, quote, making the worse, the stronger argument. They would not want to tell the truth. I'm sure that they have been proved to lay claim to knowledge when they know nothing. So this is so he, you know, he makes his defense. He doesn't do it using sophistry. He's not a sophist. He says, look, I'm going to speak plainly. Sorry, I'm not a sophist. Makes his defense and gets. <clears throat> he gets convicted and sentenced to death. 
now, and and this is in front of uh, I don't know, a few hundred of his Athens citizens peers. The jury is like a few hundred people. It's inferior. His trial is infuriating to me because it's this. You feel like if you read Plato, you feel like, okay, I, I get an idea who this Socrates dude is. He's annoying, but he's well-meaning and he's not doing anything wrong. He's actually doing quite a service. He's he's uh, revealing the charlatans who are out charging money to teach people uh, rhetoric. And then they win by basically accusing him of being them. It's very blackpilling for me. Right. Um, it's very blackpilling for me to read about his death um, and the trial and to see what happened to Socrates. Um, and it's a reminder that the guilty project, the evil people project, they point to their enemies, they point to the virtuous, and they describe their enemies as if they're writing an autobiography. They accuse the good people of being the very evil that they themselves are, and they do it often successfully. They did it successfully with Socrates. And this happens around us today all the time. And it's hard for me, and maybe it's easy for you guys, it's hard for me to avoid cynicism when I see this, because I see it all the time, all the time. Right? People who just, you know, they just convince people that they're good. They make things up out of whole cloth by projecting everything they're doing onto someone else, and people just believe it. And they and they go on being the hero, and the, and the person who's just sitting there doing their thing, you know, gets uh, vilified and. Uh, you know, fortunately, no one drinks hemlock anymore, so I'm not talking to that level. But you know, th they're the losers here because the crowd's manipulated, and the crowd's manipulated by sophists. Um, so that's why cynicism is tough for me to deal with because this, like, I read that, spend any time on Twitter or YouTube comments or whatever, and it's like, oh, this is the, everyone's like this. Here's the counterbalance to that, and maybe this will help you. Maybe I'm the only one struggling with cynicism, but I highly doubt it. In the end, Socrates is still the hero. His murderers actually lost the moral battle. Maybe it took a few thousand years, I don't know. But they lost the moral battle. And by the way, not everyone condemned him. It was a large percentage of people didn't, um, but enough did. Uh... And since his time, we've made a tremendous amount of progress, both in, I would say, philosophy, both in the understanding of things like virtue and justice and, and you know, individualism and individual sovereignty were, I'll say, discovered or invented or, or whatever. Um, we, we've, we've understood the value of, of individual sovereignty and liberty politically. Um, so we have made a bunch of, you know, we're not, they weren't sacrificing babies in Athens, but they did in a lot of other ancient cultures. We learned obvious things, you know, well, some people might argue we're still sacrificing babies now, but <laughs> it's a separate, separate point. Um, you know, we don't do that kind of stuff anymore. Um, we've made progress uh, in general. We may be backsliding a little bit, but we've made progress virtue wise. And we also made a lot of physical progress as, as uh, people as humans. Um, and I mean by that, by like technical progress, higher standards of living, uh, you know, longer life, better health, all this kind of stuff. And people dismiss a lot of this stuff as irrelevant or unrelated to like higher, more important things like virtue and goodness and all that stuff. Um, it's not, it's not, we need to live here on earth. Human life is the, is the standard ethically. And a virtuous society begets innovation, giving people individual sovereignty. It's not like it's not like innovation and 
progress in science is unrelated to individual freedom. They're very related. Giving people the freedom to live their own lives and make decisions on their own and do what they want to, to voluntarily interact with one another leads to that kind of progress. And that kind of real material progress is good for us. It's virtuous. So, um, I don't know. I, I need this remind, especially when I'm social on social media, I need to be reminded that, uh, Socrates is still kind of one in the end. If you look at it that way, we have made a lot of progress and social media is kind of the digital pool water uh, for narcissists, right? For narcissists, right? It's he's looking into, you know, if narcissists were around today, he wouldn't be stuck staring at a pool of water. He would be stuck on Twitter or Instagram, probably posting selfies, right? Um, so there's a lot of narcissists <laughs> around. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of mob mentality on social media. And the judgments on social media are emotional and ignorant and foolish. People on social media as a group are dumb and horrible. But the truth is, the truth is, all that being said, first of all, it's it's less true when you're off of social media. And this is going to sound snobbish, but it's true. Most of us are irrelevant. Most of those people are absolutely irrelevant. History is influenced by very few people in every field. None of these people that condemned Socrates, they don't matter. I'm not reading them. I'm not reading about them. They didn't have an impact other than to elevate Socrates. Right? They made him a martyr. History has been influenced. Our progress is the responsibility or the result of a very few people in, in, in different fields. There's the thinkers and the innovators, and there's the people who translate and spread those ideas to others, digest them and, and communicate them to a broader group. There's people who act on them. But mostly there's just irrelevant, irrelevant masses of people who ultimately just follow social pressure and do their thing. And for those of us who care about ideas, who care about uh, enlightenment ideas, who care about enlightenment part two, right, 2.0 or whatever, for those of us who care about that, it's up to us to, we don't have a lot of philosophical heavy lifting to do. A lot of it's been done. I mean, I'm sure there's some areas that if you want to go major in, in philosophy and spend your entire time thinking about them, yeah, there's, there's, there's areas. But in general, the philosophic heavy lifting has been done. We just need to help apply it and spread it and make it accessible to people and have them understand. We need to normalize virtue, normalize the virtue of individual sovereignty, normalize personal responsibility and freedom, normalize leaving each other alone, <laughs> right? And voluntary interaction rather than forced interactions. We need to normalize this stuff. It's there. We don't have to do that. Socrates, you know, and, and then many after him did a lot of the work. We don't have to do the hard work. We're the level of people. And, I'm, and I say we, I mean, the people who are in this community and talk about these issues and come on the show and send questions, right? We're the level of communicating this and spreading this to people, to normalizing enlightenment values, normalizing virtue. And that's our job. And I think, uh, I don't know if we can do it, you know, en masse before I die or anything, but uh, ultimately the masses, the mindless automatons, the zombies out there, they, they're just going to follow whatever social pressure there is. Right. They don't set the agenda. And for a long time, the left has been the cultural influencers. It's our job to be the cultural influencers. And to do that, you have to have a backbone. You got to have a backbone. You got to normalize virtue. You can't be cynical. You got to normalize virtue. You got to stand up to this abhorrent behavior from administrative authoritarians and, and show people that, hey, there are people who are operating from sincerity. There are people who are operating from virtue. There are people trying to be good. There are people willing to say, not only do I want you to leave me alone, but I'll leave you alone. I do believe in individual sovereignty. I am going to adopt that as a principle, and I am going to implement it, even if I don't like what you're doing. It is coming from a good place. We can show them that there is an alternative future that is not 
the socialist slash authoritarian hellhole the left is intent on uh, driving us to right now. Because most people are just going to respond to social pressure. And I, and I think the individualists have not been applying social pressure. And I don't mean being a jerk about it. I just mean we're kind of, well, you know, live and let live. And that that's fine. But bad ideas need to be called out. Dishonest behavior needs to be called out. Bad behavior needs to be called out. We need to stand up and have a backbone and show them that, hey, at least in our community, at least with people that we know, we treat each other, treat each other with respect. We treat each other well. We're honest. And we're virtuous. Not that we'll never make mistakes, but, you know, in general. Um, I also think it helps to remember, ultimately, that evil is parasitic. I think a lot of people forget this. They get very afraid of evil. And yeah, evil does suck. And you know, plenty of places I wouldn't want to live that are run by evil people, including where I live now. Uh, <laughs> but um, e evil is ultimately parasitic. It needs the good to survive. And a good way to think about this is uh, you can't steal if no one produces, right? Someone who's only a thief dies of starvation without good people who produce, right? Evil is ultimately just parasitic. Even, even uh, emotionally and in kind of the realm of virtue, right? If you want to have praise, even under false pretenses, you can't really get that praise, if genuine praise is available, it doesn't mean anything if there's not also genuine praise, right? If if uh, if compliments are thrown out and they're meaningless, that doesn't mean anything when you get any. But if compliments are reserved for great achievements and you trick someone into thinking that you're, you've you achieved greatness, the compliment maybe feels like it has more meaning. It, it, it doesn't ultimately uh, for you. But even that value isn't there without good people doing real things, right? So even on that kind of, I'll say spiritual, but psychological level, uh, evil is parasitic. It It is not uh, fit to survive in reality. It can't. It needs to, to be parasitic off of the good. Only the good is pro-life, pro pro-reality, pro-survival here in reality. And the evil just, you know, it's like a vampire, just sucks off of it. So the story of Socrates' death to me is an important reminder of, A, the tactics of evil, the power of masses, uh, and how they can be swayed and literally 180 degrees out of the truth. I mean, it's it's so tragic that Socrates is accused of being the opposite of what he is and, it, and actually accused. It would be like me being accused of being a social justice warrior and going down in flames for it. It's like and like a, a, a radical leftist. Right. And that that will be me on trial. I'm not, I'm not trying to compare myself to Socrates. I'm, I'm not his level, obviously. But like that, that's what it is. It's it's that kind of inversion. But like I said, he's also kind of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Right. The, if you strike me down, I should become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. Socrates has. He's become more powerful. We read him. He's a he's part of a canon of of Western philosophy now. And. Uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe if he hadn't been convicted that wouldn't be true i'm not sure i'm not sure so that's my socrates story i'll do a few super chats and then we'll end because we have a couple super chats that i missed uh, mina vanderliest says what do you think about the farmers protest in netherlands it's warming my heart in dark times rather be optimistic since yes People suck. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but what I have, what I do know about it, what I've read, uh, it also is warming my heart. I, it's akin to, um, it, it's, a, it's kind of akin to the, the freedom convoy. Uh, they're, 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 you know, they're just like, you know what, we're not gonna <laughs> screw your energy requirements and whatever I, the government's like placing all these requirements on them and changing the, the, the requirements for farmers, and they're just, they've had enough of being told what to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, that is, that does warm my heart. I'm not super bullish on the Netherlands being the cradle of the next enlightenment, but, uh, but Hey, in a, in a world in which we are so interconnected, 
Um, maybe the cradle of the Enlightenment 2.0 isn't a one partic one particular physical place. Maybe it really starts to take hold uh, online. I don't know. But yeah, it warms my heart too. Uh, I should read more about it because I don't know a whole lot. But uh, like I said, what I've read. All right. Um, G-Man. G-Man says, so there were people who charged others to be taught things they knew nothing about. Sounds like modern day universities. <laughs> Yes, uh, kind of, kind of it is. Um, I think modern universities are actually worse. But yeah, uh, it is It is very much like that. Um, I mean, if you haven't read, I don't get too geeky, but if you haven't read any, Plato, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to read the whole thing. But, you know, if you read like, uh, Maybe Gorgias and Mino and uh, what's another good one? I don't know th th there's a few. If you if you read a few of the dialogues, uh, maybe maybe read Phaedrus too. Much about love. Um, you'll get a feel for for who Socrates was, uh, kind of how annoying he was. But also uh, Protagoras, if I didn't say that, read Protagoras. Uh, but also how, you know, he's a good guy. Uh, and and, and, and um, more importantly, he really does reveal that the emperor has no clothes with these, these hoity-toity intellectuals in Athens. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, if you're thinking about uh, things like what universities are like today and philosophy and how uh, how ideas are spreading or how they're treated um, it's good to see it's good to see it's good to read Socrates because you can kind of see parallels to how he was dealing with things and the kind of people he was dealing with and the kind of arguments and the kind of things that they they did and said um, and how he would trap them he trapped them a lot uh, he trapped them he trapped them quite a lot again. Sometimes a little annoying, but, you know. Uh, Greg the Baritone says, Carter, did you ever see the movie The Emperor's Club? Good, not great, but I really liked it. I have not seen it, so uh, maybe I'll put it on my list. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for watching. I guess we did go f a full two hours. Um, I always think it's going to be like an hour, and it always bleeds to two hours. But um, it's good to be good to be back. Uh and I hope you enjoyed the show. Let me know if you want me to talk about other topics. Uh, I do love topic suggestions, so just send them in. Um, you can. I don't read the YouTube comments mostly, but someone will uh, and send them to me. If you're on the Discord channel, though, you can just bug me on Discord and say, hey, you know, uh, this is what I want you to talk about. Argue with me. Uh, that can be fun sometimes, too. And uh, anyway, thanks for all. Oh, oh one more. One more super chat. Let me read this super chat before uh, we go. Uh, this is from Chris Hanna and friends. The philosophical work left to do is all unscrambling. They purposely scrambled the Rubik's Cube. There's a ton of work to do in that realm, but here you're doing it. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is unscrambling. That's a good way. It's a good metaphor, right? It is unscrambling a purposely scrambled Rubik's Cube. The thing is... Um, it's relatively easy to start with the unscrambled Rubik's cube, right? Like I don't, where's that book? Like I have scrambling books like this, Angela, the women race in class. I have leftist weird scrambling books. And when I read them, it's like, what the hell? Right. Um, so it's, I don't feel like I need to figure out how to unscramble the Rubik's cube for myself. Uh, because that's been done. There's philosophers, just, you know, read them. Things make sense. I mean, a lot of the work, like that's what I mean by the heavy lifting has been done. But it's like all, everyone else has these Rubik's Cubes and they went to college and they scrambled them, removed the stickers and replaced them with, you know, emoticon stickers and, you know, maybe dyed them all purple or like they just took out some cubes. I mean, they've been totally trashed, right? And uh, my job is to kind of try and explain, and I think all of our jobs is to try and explain, look, here's what a Rubik's Cube should look like. 
<laughs> right? Here's how to go from this pile of plastic garbage that you've now been given out of university to a Rubik's Cube, which is much more functional, right? Um, so I don't feel like getting to the Rubik's Cube myself is very difficult because I didn't have to figure it out, right? Uh, great philosophers before me have done it. There's sometimes there's an application that I have to figure out, like how does it apply to this particular situation? And and that's always fun to do, but it's it's mostly like, okay, there's a lot of scrambled people. How do we help them unscramble? And uh, as you guys know, I don't focus on uh, people who are too far gone. I think if they're uh, far gone social justice lefties, I have actually zero evidence that they ever recover, almost zero evidence that they ever truly recover. Um, so that's just not my focus. I mean, someone wants to go into the lion's den and do that. That's good for them. Um, but uh, but I think there are a lot of relatively well-meaning, nor I'll just call them normies, and I don't mean that condescendingly, just well, relatively well-meaning normies out living their lives, raising their kids, having a family or being happy or doing their thing. And they're looking around going, what the hell is going on? And they've never really thought of what the Rubik's Cube in this metaphor should look like and um, and what's been done to the Rubik's Cube. They're not really noticing it. And to sort of point it out to them and help them see this is the craziness and here's the an antidote. Uh, I think all of us can do that. And I am trying to do that on this show to the best of my ability. Uh, but, you know, I think, look, a lot of you people, I don't know all of the people here in chat, but a lot of you are smart. You have great questions, you make great points. Sometimes you argue with me and you have uh, great counterpoints and whatever. You guys are part of the 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 fleet of uh, enlightenment warriors that can go out and hold the line and 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 call people out when they're being just blatantly dishonest and, and trying to concern troll you into, you know, going down rabbit holes that waste your time and and not starting from principles and ignoring individual sovereignty and uh saying irrational self-contradictory ridiculous things like you guys know you guys mostly i just you know again not all of you i don't know all of you but a lot of you know the core of enlightenment philosophy well enough to be doing this and i think you raise your families this way you you interact with friends and colleagues this way you don't shut up you don't pretend to go along with this crap, uh, I think it's empowering. And, it, you know, the few people who, um, the few people who I know from, uh, like my previous quote life, right, who know what I do when they find out what I'm doing now, usually, not always, but usually there's like this secret, oh my God, I kind of think that too. I just, I don't, I don't really know and it's confusing and thank you so much. Like they're, they, they're just, they're confused and there's and they're they're in a world in which it seems like radical leftism is the norm and it's not the norm and we can make that clear that it's not the norm and we can make virtue and individual uh liberty and reason the norm and the standard and make the leftists appear to be the crazy people that they actually are and that shouldn't be too, ha too bad because they actually are crazy all right <sighs> enough of that um Thank you again, uh, Chris Hanna, for the super chat and for everyone else's super chats. G-Man did a lot as well. So, and Judge Lot. So, uh, thank you to all you who support the show. Please go to unsafespace.com if you want to support this series or any other series. Sometimes uh, people don't like my style, but maybe they like Beverly or Keith or Alex talking about similar things in, in, in a similar way, different way. Um, so, go check that stuff out. If you want to join the Discord discussion, you just have to be a financial supporter. Even at $1 a month, you get to be in Discord. Uh, and do that. So as always, like I said, I always uh, love uh, topic suggestions. So please send them along uh, and check out Beverly's birthday bash on Token Minority Report tomorrow. And with that, uh, have a good evening, everyone. And uh, I will see you on Monday for Narrative Dissonance. Thanks for sticking around until the end. If you're new to Unsafe Space, check out our deep content library that includes discussions with everyone from James Lindsay to Brett Weinstein. And please consider helping to fund our work by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on a variety of social media platforms, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space Discord server, which is open to financial supporters at any level. 
We hope to see you there. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production is known by the state of California to cause unregulated ideation that may be harmful to bureaucrats. Association with the following individuals, or tacos, is strictly prohibited. Apropos of nothing, I was just wondering how would you feel about another pandemic? Your president is in full control of his mental faculties. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake. Okay, you're going to get a bonus because I meant to read this, and it's a line that I love. This is from Gorgias. This is Socrates. He he kind of predicts that he's going to be put on trial. Um, <laughs> and he says, For I'll be judged the way a doctor would be judged by a jury of children if a pastry chef were to bring accusations against him. That's your Socrates for the day. Take care, everyone.